everybody. Thank you so much for coming today to this lecture. Uh, my name is Reena Kashyap, and I'm uh, on the board of directors of NSICA. Um, one, the first thing I want to ask you is to please switch off your gizmos here so that we don't get any phones ringing during the presentation. And um, I'm sure, I hope you've all downloaded the NSICA app. And if you have, um, Make sure after the lecture is over that you go to the, uh, below, right the, below the description of the work of, the, of this presentation because there's a survey. And if you take that survey, we'd greatly appreciate it because the way we do our programming is really based on all your feedback. So we'd really appreciate that. And the presenters who take a lot of time doing the presentation, they would love to hear also. So I would appreciate if you do that. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I just want to start off. So I. You're sure you're here to listen to the business plans and toolkits lecture, right? Because if you aren't, then you're in the wrong room. Uh, there's the exit right there. So <laughs> I w we want to make sure we have the right audience. And so I thank you all for staying. You're right, obviously right here. And you're obviously here because you're really interested to learn more about business plans and tools. And we have two stellar um, presenters here. And um, I'm sure I will learn as much as all of you here. And we're so happy to welcome Ann Metcalf and, um, and um, Noah uh, um, Kiesecker. So sorry, just had to look for that. So, thank you so much. So business plans and tools. Um, what, what, what you're going to learn today is a flexible, open, and adaptable tools built on the shoulders of sound business structures are the, professional, are the future of professional practices. And we're here to learn from both our presenters about, sugar, about springboards, toolkits, and resources tailored to the creative um, business plans that will help you make a living and life in the arts. So um, I want to introduce Anna Metcalf first. Anna Metcalf works as artist development coordinator at Springboard for the Arts in St. Paul, Minnesota, a ceramic artist herself. Anna makes. Um, work focusing on social and environmental change. She is a recipient of several grants and awards, notably from the Jerome Foundation and the Minnesota State Art Bo Arts Board. So thank you, Anna, for being here. And um, Noah Kiesecker is, is the Director of Artistic Development at Springboard for the Arts, where he leads professional development initiatives, including workshops, curriculum, and consulting for artists. He is an active composer and multimedia artist and a board member of Minnesota Citizen for the Arts. So please help me welcoming Noah and Anna. Thank you. I'll go first. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. It's really exciting to be here. Um, as, as I was introduced, um, I'm not a ceramic artist, but I took my first ceramics class in January, so I'm officially a convert. Um, look out for me in Sika 2018. Um, so what we're doing today is talking specifically about a section of our work of art toolkit. We have these nice, lovely print copies. The most important thing for you to know if you're interested in our resources and business is that this whole thing and all the little parts we talk about today are free. Um, we'll have a link. You can go and download this whole 12-unit, 140-page curriculum of our workshops on business skills. Comes with a user guide with resources, press releases. If you decide you want to teach these workshops yourself, you're welcome to do that. Um, more is more sharing economy, all those sorts of things. We do professional and economic development for organizations as well as individual artists of all disciplines. Um, and today we're going to be working through um, how to use the the units in this toolkit to get started on a business plan for your artistic practice or small initiative. Um, all of our other toolkits, there's about 20 of them from across the country, are downloadable on the Creative Exchange, which um, we'll have a slide for that. So powered by Springboard. Um, and otherwise, let's get going. So I'm going to give you a brief, oh, here we go. Bloop. Um, you can find us at your local social media restaurants like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, at Springboard Arts. So if you have something to say, good or bad, point them that way. Um, mostly good, though, please. Um, oops, where are my notes? You know, where's my things? Okay. 
So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our professional development resources. Uh, Springboard was founded in 1978 as a program of United Arts. We were basically just a little cubicle in a building in downtown St. Paul. Uh, in 1991, we broke off and turned into resources and counseling for the arts as our own organization. Um, and then in 2002, we rebranded to Springboard for the Arts um, as our own nonprofit organization with our own programs that run the gamut from healthcare for artists to fiscal sponsorship to strategic planning, resource development, um, and including a rural artist um, office in Fergus Falls. So we have both a metro footprint and a rural footprint, as well as a national platform for sharing. Um, in terms of our professional development, it really took off uh, these workshops in 2010 when we launched the Arts Development Project, where we taught all 10 of these workshops in 11 regions across the state of Minnesota. This is a map with one pin for every single artist that took this. So 280 artists across the state of Minnesota um, in 11 regions, and it produced the first workbook, the first time we formalized it into one document um, to give to artists. Um, and then as we're moving toward this toolkit model of giving away our resources for free, um, in 2011 we launched uh, community supported art off of the community supported agriculture model. Um, and that went pretty well. People understood food and local producers. Um, and so we said, you know, do we want to sell the donuts or do we want to sell the donut recipe? We decided to make the recipe and give it away for free. In fact, PDX CSA, does anyone familiar with that? The one that is on sale right now in Portland is happening. Um, but these are all the cities, uh, 60 communities where people have taken our toolkit for this community development to support artists and made it their own. Their own logos, their own branding. Um, the only thing they need us for is advice and we give that to them. So um, if you want that toolkit, also on Creative Exchange. Um, the Work of Art Toolkit came together in 2015 where we said, well, that CSA thing went pretty well. People seem to like that. What if we packaged up all of our business skills resources into a toolkit that we would share openly and freely with anyone in the country or the world um, and see how that goes? Um, it was funded by the Tremaine Foundation. And to date, it has been shared over 2,400 times since we launched it, um, what was it? It was in, I think it was December of 2015. So it's clipping right along. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and she's gonna talk about how to navigate to the basics of business plans and how to navigate the toolkit to help you build that resource. So take it away. Thanks, Noah. So how many of you here are interested in selling your work? Yeah. <laughs> um, and even if you're not interested in owning your own business, um, there's probably a part of you that feels compelled to at least have some kind of direction. Um, and so when I think about writing a business plan, it's as much for people who are opening their own business and trying to make a go at profitability, but it's also, I think, for people who just want some direction in their career. So for me, that's a little bit of everybody um, in the art world. So why write a business plan? Um, there's a couple of really good reasons. One is to figure out if your idea is feasible. Um, it'll help you make some really good decisions with a lot more information. Um, and it'll help you kind of organize that information. And um, it will, I think, also help you determine whether or not your business is good for business or if it's a passion project that you want to kind of foster in a different kind of way. So what's in a business plan? Um, one of the first things that I think as artists we like to think about with business plans is the product. And I know that that word product is, uh, gives some artists the heebie-jeebies because we like to think of our, our, the things that we make not as products but as um, you know, parts of ourselves and our souls. <laughs> but I think when we're thinking about getting our work out into the marketplace, we do have to think about them as products. Um, and so we think about products and their, how we describe our products to our customers. We think about our marketing, uh, marketing plans, how we actually communicate with uh, our customers. How do we place a value on our work? 
um, when we think about timeline, when does it that we break even? And also, how do we make time for new ideas and our family and other kinds of work that we do? Um, and then where does our money come from and where does it go, right? So thinking about a budget. Um, and so when I think about navigating this workbook, um, it's as much about writing a business plan as it is um, as it is actually thinking about navigating my career. Um, so just a couple of ways that this workbook works. Um, it's focused at the end, the last unit, unit number 12, is writing a business plan. Um, so in unit 12, we talk all about how our products work and how we think about them um, in relationship to each other and to the rest of the market. In unit four, we talk about marketing. Um, and in unit five, we talk about promotion. In unit seven, we discuss how to price your work. In, units, in unit eight, we go over budgeting and record keeping. I know it's our favorite topic. <laughs> and in unit number two, we talk about time and how we negotiate it relative to all of the other things in life that we want to be doing. And so really quickly, I'm just gonna kind of break out and show you a few of the units and we're gonna pull that information apart um, and just kind of dive into a couple of the topics. Um, but a lot of what I'm going to show you is just to help you navigate the toolkit, which, of course, like Noah said, is available to all of you for free. So in unit number four, we talk about marketing um, and all of the many ways of getting your work out into the world. Um, one of the things that I think is most important is identifying who are our buyers or our target market um, and also how to develop a brand, what, what that looks like, and, um, and how we talk about it. So communication. Um, and then also thinking about the four Ps, or product, price, placement, and promotion. And all of this, of course, is uh, made, made possible by doing a lot of research. And market research looks, um, uh, the word or the, the name feels kind of daunting uh, to a lot of artists. But market research can be really fun. How many of you are going to shows while you're here? How many of you are maybe buying a couple of things while you're here? Guess what, that's market research. The thing that makes it different is if you jot down some notes, I call it super sleuthing. Um, and uh, I like to think of myself as um, Sherlock Holmes when I go to a show for just about 10 minutes, take note of who's there, who's buying what, what are they wearing, and voila, your market research is done for the evening. <laughs> so let's really quickly talk about the most important thing that we do, which is making the products themselves. Um, in unit number 12, we have uh, a really great exercise that kind of cracks open what it is that we do and how we think about them as products. Um, and kind of unlike this amazing GIF, <laughs> we have the most control over our products as artists. Um, we think about our products the most but we don't always take the time to think about how to communicate our ideas and even what our products are and how they fit into the marketplace with our audience um, or even from our audience's perspectives. So we have this really great uh, exercise in unit number 12 called the product tree. And this is something, I'm just gonna crack this open a, with a little bit more depth here. Um, one of the, uh, I think, most fun things that this exercise can help do um, is help you understand a little bit more about um, what are the different branches or arms of your business and uh, how they relate to each other, and then also where funding streams might come from um, or who your audiences might be and how they might be different from each other. So as you can tell here, um, it's a, uh, the, tr the trunk of the tree, the base of the tree is of course ceramics, we're all here because of clay. Um, but if we break it down, those branches might look a little different. Like for example, I might make uh, some dinnerware that I might market and sell um, in a retail capacity. So the branches, or the leaves, are uh, you know cups, plates, vases. And then of course, I might also branch off and do some corporate commissions um, or some other kind of commission work. Um, and so the manifestation of that is gonna be a little bit different. Wall tiles or um, special plates 
And as you might imagine, your audience for those, thi those different branches are gonna be different. So thinking about them with different, uh, within that different context can help you determine a better marketing plan. And then there may also be another part of your business that you foster um, that's gonna be even totally different. Like for example, public art. Um, which uh, is something that you might do on the side. It might come as you're being funded by a grant or a, um, a, another donor or Kickstarter campaign. So it might look a lot different. The fundraising for it and the, uh, the um, execution of it might look a lot different than some of the other work that you're doing. Um, and so does, I guess the big question is, does it fit on the same tree? Do you make another tree for it? And the answer is really gonna be different for a lot of different people. Um, so this, this process can do a lot of things. It can help clarify, again, how all of your work relates. Um, it can also help you determine what's passion and what's business. Do they belong on the same tree? Or maybe do you need to grow a separate little passion garden underneath your tree, your business tree? Um, there's lots of different ways to think about it. And also, um, you may determine um, that the tree analogy is something that you want to roll with. Um, and one, one really good, um, I think, way of doing this in your own studio or in your home and in your, in your, the, the time that you've set aside to work on this is with a bunch of color-coded post-it notes. That's my favorite way. So you can kind of move things around and um, begin to assess how these things fit together. So another thing that we do um, in our toolkit, um, in unit number eight, um, how many of you have already done your taxes? Whoa, you guys are so far ahead of me. How many of you are like, taxes what? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, record keeping and budgeting. Um, but I think one of the most important things that uh, has come out of my understanding of um, as I've been thinking more about um, how to keep really good records of what happens in my business um, and also um, think about budgeting for the future is that really record keeping is about our past, but it's for making better decisions in our future. And so what's in this particular toolkit? Um, we've got some exciting surprisingly exciting spreadsheets. <laughs> Not a lie. <laughs> we have some helpful tips on registering and recording your work. Um, there's a couple of really great examples on how to do that. Um, we also have um, uh, some really great tips on how long to keep your records and what, they're, what they can be used for. Um, and of course, um, how to create a budget for your future, which isn't that something that we all really want. One of the biggest struggles that I have found in my own art career and that I talk with artists about is of course this uh, notion of sustainability. How can I keep on doing what I'm doing? And also, how can I make sure that it is gonna be there for me in two years or five years? How can I count on it? Um, and so creating a good budget is half the battle, I think, understanding it. And so how many of you have a registered business in the room? Nice. How many of you ha are thinking about registering a business? Nice. And if I took another survey, we could kind of go and we could get deep into the woods here. But I'm curious, how many people have a sole proprietorship? And how many LLCs are in the room? Nice, raise your hands super high for those LLCs. Good, nice, that's awesome. So when we look at the logistics of all of this, how do we figure out what is the best kind of business for our, our particular business? Um, and what are some of the things that we need to consider when it comes to making all of that legal, when it contracts and um, uh, intellectual property and things like that? Um, and so, uh, unit number nine cracks that open. Um, we talk a little bit about um, different kinds of business, whether or not you're gonna be a partner or if you're going to um, open a corporation or a sole proprietorship. Um, and 
all of these things um, may, or a nonprofit, <laughs> um, and all of these things might be uh, something that feel really distant to some of you. Some of you might be in the thick of it. Um, and, uh, and so there's also, in, in a kind of embedded in, in your business, of course, is you as an artist, um, and thinking about all of the creative ways that you need to nurture your own, your own work and your creativity. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Noah, because he's going to talk a little bit more about the personal side of um, running a business. Yes, so the personal side, um, now I'm going to tell you about my childhood. Um, not really, but I will tell you one of my favorite Jay-Z quotes, which is not a quote, but a lyric where he says, I'm not a businessman, I'm a business man. Um, and I think I take that to heart because from my experience working with artists and organizations, um, one of the daunting parts about writing a business plan is this sort of alienating yourself from uh, that creative side, you know, and that you come to this work as an individual, um, as a person with a vision and a lot of feelings and emotions, and you create meaningful work that connects you to other people, the people that buy it, the people that support you, your colleagues, uh, and then you come and sit down with someone like me, and I basically pull the heart out of your chest, throw it over my shoulder, and said, okay, let's talk business. And that's not a very appealing thing for a lot of people to do when uh, you're trying to sell something that's so meaningful to you. Um, and so there is a portion of this workbook uh, that I'm gonna talk about now, which is more about the individual artist. Um, that is the businessman behind the business man. Um, so, uh, in, oops, I went backwards like that penguin. Um, so for instance, the artist statement. In the portfolio section of this, unit three, um, in a business plan, there must be an owner of this organization, of the LLC, of the NPO, of the corporation. They're going to say, who is the executive director? What is your title? What do you do? What's your job description? Uh, we start with a very basic artist statement. Who you are, what you do, and why you do it, right? Um, I have an exercise that I've created in here called Five Facets to help you generate material around that, where I ask people to, um, oops, I lose something. Da -da 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 where I ask people to talk about their work to make lists in these five categories. I want to know the facts about your business, non-subjective, objective facts, irrefutable information that is necessary to understand if an alien came out of the sky and came down and you put on a lab coat and hand him a clipboard, what would be on it? Um, influence is inspiration. What makes your clock tick? From what soil did you grow? like nutrients that have created the work that you do. That's crucial historical information that goes into the business history section of your business plan. Um, I ask people to describe their work using all five senses. What's your pot smell like? You know, Does it have a nice sound to it? Um, all of these things for a very descriptive, memorable, um, sticky language. Uh, the spaces and places, either geography, rhetorical, philosophical, metaphorical, um, locations from which um, your work comes, or you as an individual artist, and then your beliefs. And that if this business is going to survive, somebody needs to hold on to the belief system, the value system um, that this whole thing is built on. Uh, if there is no heart or soul or value system behind it, then you are as good as any other machine on the road. Um, but we're looking for something uh, a little bit better than that. Um, the second part, uh, human part of it, is time. Uh, everybody has 24 hours in the day. How we split it up is different for everyone. So I do a very, very simple exercise in here. Um, there are some techniques, but one of them is basically there's 168 hours in a week. If you sleep 40 and you work 56, you got 72 left for everything else. There. So that's a baseline. If you haven't thought about your professional business and creative life in terms of the number 72, try this and see how it goes. Um, the next one we do uh, a lot of is capital. Um, who has capital? Who has cash in their pocket right now? Liquid capital. Cool. You can leave that up here at the end of the session. Um, stocks, bonds, I'll take those as well. Um, but so for instance, we go through a lot of the other types of capital that you have. What is a, um, 
infrastructure capital, if you have a studio, if you have a physical space in which to throw your work or fire your work, that's infrastructure, it's an asset. Uh, natural capital would be things like rivers and mountains, um, fields, access to wood for burning, things of that nature. There's all these um, value systems around you that if you are going to make a business that is profitable, that has leverage in a market, you can't just say how many dollars are in your bank account. I mean, you can do that, but you're selling yourself short in terms of how to leverage relationships if you're not mapping out the various types of capital, which includes human capital, sweat equity, as well as social capital. Do you have five million followers on Twitter? That's valuable, right? So we talk a lot about that. And then um, when you get to the end of this and you're trying to convert your, um, your human self back into a business, uh, both in the social media section uh, and the promotion section, we have a form of a very basic editorial calendar um, in terms of the strategy of constructing a message. And that message is that you have to decide what you're going to say, you have to have a tool to do it, which I've mislabeled strategy, that word should be tool, but you have to pick the tool, whether it's digital, print, verbal, dancing, what have you. You have to choose a time and a duration for that message to be executed with that tool and determine the cost of it, whether it is your time or your money. What is it? Purchased ads, knocking on doors. So this is the sequence. And then we have a goal you're trying to achieve and an impact or the results of that. And I've broken the goal down into three categories, which is for audience development. You can either broaden your audience by getting more of the same people. You can uh, deepen the audience by getting the people that love your work to love it more, super fans, or you can diversify. Get people that have never bought a, a custom-made cup before to buy a custom-made cup. Brand new things. So this little strategy comes in a spreadsheet format that you can fill out um, for a whole calendar year if you like. Um, and then I think I'm gonna kick it back to Anna to talk about marketing and things of that nature. Thanks. All right, so when I think about marketing, sometimes um, when, I, when I teach the marketing workshop, um, people come to it a little bit begrudgingly, like, okay, fine. If I, am, I, what I really wanna do is be spending all the time in my studio. Can it just go out into the world and do its own thing? And wouldn't that be amazing? Um, but how many of you have that happen? So I'm glad that that's the case because my experience is that all of us have to do some kind of self-promotion. That's probably why many of you are here. Um, and so the question is always, um, what is the return on investment, both in time and also in other forms of capital, money? Um, and so there's this really wonderful little pie chart here that we can start looking at, which is um, what is the... Um, what is the total number of dollars that you spend on marketing? What is the cost of production? And then how much are you making back from that? Um, and then how do you figure out the math on it? So this is a, an example of how a really successful marketing campaign might work. Um, let's just say that you come home making um, uh, $8,400, almost $8,500, but you've spent $1,200 on that. That means the return on that investment is over 600%. That's great. That's amazing. Um, the numbers don't always look that great, but what's really, uh, um, I think, useful to know is to at least have a baseline uh, formula by which you can kind of determine how well you're doing. So you can try some things out, and the um, important thing to remember is not everything is going to be super successful, but if you, if you um, leverage it against the things that are successful, hopefully you'll average out positive in the end, and you'll also know what not to do next time, or what is really successful and what will be helpful next time. So that little thing that I said, cost of production, what is that? 
Um, this is one of those, uh, I think, um, uh, amazing conundrums for a lot of artists is how do I figure out what is not only the value of my work, um, but also how much, it, how much it actually took me to make it. What is the cost of producing it? And uh, so this is a little formula we like to call LMOP, um, which stands for labor, material, overhead, and profit. Um, and there's the, in our pricing workshop, um, it, there's some really wonderful and helpful ways of thinking through um, how to calculate labor. Um, that's a really uh, challenging thing for a lot of people, particularly if you make things in batches. Um, how long does it take you to make it, and how much are you paying yourself an hour? Also, what is the material cost that goes into creating something? Um, and then overhead, holy overhead is what I like to say. There's a couple of formulas in the pricing unit that will really um, break out how to figure out what overhead is, which is essentially all the stuff that you pay for even if you're not working in your studio. Um, and then how many of you factor in a profit margin to your work? Because if you do, you can use those things for things like oh, going on a residency, taking yourself to Enseca next year, all of those great things. And then you'll arrive, of course, at your wholesale price. Um, and I think one of the other things that we talk about in the pricing unit that is not inherently built into calculating the cost of production is how we think about value on top of, of course, the data, the raw numbers. Um, and there's a lot of information about perceived value um, and added value in the second half of that workshop. So back to marketing really quickly. Um, once you've found out the retail value of your coffee mug, which turns out to be $456, <laughs> you may take the Jerry Salt's route and just move the decimal point and call it $45. <laughs> How many of you were in the opening ceremonies last night? <laughs> Um, but if you decide not to do that, you might be thinking, okay, I've got a $456 coffee mug. Who's the person who's going to buy it? Guess what? Somebody out there is interested in that $456 coffee mug. I promise you. You just have to find that person. And so identifying your target market is actually one of the trickier things that we do as artists, but probably one of the more important things. Um, and so we do this uh, really great exercise where we start to figure out who is our market? Who are the people who are interested most in what we do? Um, so, and we break this down with a couple of different kinds of data. The first, of course, is demographic information, which is what we all collect when, or what our government collects when the census comes around. So people's ages, their gender, their income levels, um, where they live, their location, what kind of uh, job do they have. Um, all of that information helps give us data about people. And of course, then there's behavioral data, um, which is uh, we, another way of saying that is um, uh, psychographic information. Uh, and that essentially looks at people's behaviors or their opinions, values, activities, and their habits. Um, so for example, how many people here in the room are wearing some version of a clog? Oh man, fewer people than I thought. <laughs> I've got them on. Mine are steel-toed. Um, but when we think about um, the crossovers of what we're purchasing uh, and also what our audience is experiencing or where they're placing their values, we may discover um, that uh, there's things in common with some of the um, other sectors that we're intersecting with. Um, so for example, um, if, uh, if you are thinking about um, who's going to be the person that is going to purchase that $456 mug, you might be looking at um, an in a location where there's um, uh, an income range that will support that kind of, who will have um, the kind of uh, disposable income who will support that kind of purchase. And that's going to eliminate a certain number of people um, from your list, but at least you've narrowing in on that 15% of the people who might be interested in your work. Um, and how great would it be to have that information at your fingertips as opposed to spending money and time marketing to the wrong kind of person? And so all of this might sound really enticing. And I wish, so the, these workshops, um, uh, we tend to teach them in, uh, each workshop tends to be about two and a half hours long. Um, and so to compress all 12 of them into one hour is a tiny bit challenging. 
Um, but what we also offer to the people who um, are interested in taking our workshops, um, of course, are uh, some resources online. So you can download these things for free. You can also join our Facebook group and share your experiences and resources. Um, we have a lot of information on our website on how to do that. Um, and, um, and the other thing that actually we have found to be really successful is to form study groups. So get the toolkit, form a group, and go through the curriculum together. Or bring it to your university. Um, perhaps you also teach in a community center. Um, grab a packet, get some resources, and form a group. Um, it's a great thing to do uh, alongside other people who are thinking about the same things that you are. And I think with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Noah. <laughs> okay, so that is our quick and dirty how to write a business plan from our toolkit in 45 minutes. Um, and just to kind of cycle back a little bit, each of those little examples that we gave you, um, the purpose of it is that in an outline of a business plan, you need to do all of these things. If you went to a bank to get a business loan and you didn't do your market research, or have a target market specified, or you don't have a marketing strategy, you don't have any kind of financials on what kind of return or profit margins your business have, um, you're gonna get shut down. Um, not that banks are the only way to fund things, which we're gonna talk about in a second, um, but there are necessary parts, and this is how Springboard works through it. We take business and we look at it through the lens of artists because we are all are also practicing artists. Um, as we say, for artists, by artists. Um, if you are interested in this toolkit, as I said, Creative Exchange, you can grab one of these cards. Um, these are some other toolkits that we offer. They're all free. We have things like CSA, um, a neighborhood postcard project. We have a pop-up museum. Some of them are very large, like our community development uh, toolkits about how to activate and build partnerships with municipal governments and things, and others are very small, like how to have a picnic with your friends and put frames around things you find in the dirt. Um, so please explore those, um, it's fun. There's also a lot of stories uh, from across the country of artists doing uh, things like that. Um, but for now, the last little exercise we're going to do uh, is sort of a financial game that, uh, that we've created. Um, this is a seahorse buck from Springboard, and I'm going to explain how this game works. This is in unit 10, the end of the funding unit, and the purpose of this is to do a couple of things. Um, one, it's a way to connect to your community, and two, it's an exercise in expanding what value and assets are available to you um, across disciplines, even internally with what you do. So. Um, Anna and some helpers are going to go pass out seahorse bucks. You're all getting these right now. Um, I believe with the number of people, I think everybody should be able to like grab a stack, take three seahorse bucks, and then pass it down. And if you don't get one in your row, then it should just circle back. But just everybody gets seahorse bucks while I give the, the instructions. And we'll do a quick little demo um, of this also. So uh, it's affectionately called Instaconomy. I'll have you know that I named this before Instagram, so I'm gonna take credit for, for half of Instagram's branding because I invented the word Insta, obviously. Um, so in the book, uh, there's a page of seahorse bucks which you can photocopy or print out or whatever. So it says, cut out the three seahorse bucks from each one. Um, on each one, fill in your personal information. So you'll see that there's a space for your name on the left, there's a space for your email. On the right, um, there's our Twitter handle and our website, because marketing. Um, and then you can add any service, experience, product, idea, capital, or anything of value that you can offer um, in place of cold hard cash, because this is the cash. Uh, and we'll give you some examples of those. But when I was talking earlier about what are, types of capital do you have, do you have infrastructure capital? Do you have material capital? Do you have social capital that you can offer to someone? You write that on the back. So you could say, I have 
five million followers on Pinterest, and I would be happy to um, pin some of your work to my five million followers. I could do that, like a promoted pin or a sponsored pin. That would be of value, correct? Um, and then we're going to open trading. Uh, so talk to others, uh, tell them what you have, ask what they have, um, and feel free to trade as many times as you want. Uh, so for instance, um, something that you get and trade to this person could then get traded to that. And so at the end of the day, uh, you end up with the name, email, and some asset from a person that is 10 people removed from you. So we're going to do this. Are you ready? Does everyone have a, raise your hand if you don't have any seahorse bucks. If you don't have any seahorse dollars yet. I see one hand. It's working. OK. Um, so what I need, yeah. Yeah, actually, hold on. I'm going to, where are my seahorse bucks? I filled some out already, because I'm going to ask for two get sea guinea pigs. Sea guinea pigs? Do I have two, one or two? We've got a couple. <laughs> <laughs> These eager sea guinea pigs. Come on down. You're on the prices. Right, seahorse edition. So for instance, I filled mine out. Um, I have, because I'm a composer, underscoring music for a promotional video. I can write that for you. I have, um, I could write a podcast theme song if you have a podcast or bumper music. You know, bumper music is when you're changing segments and it's like ding, 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 ding. And then we're like, next. The marketplace. Um, I could do that for you. Uh, and the other one is two hours of business plan strategy consulting. Let's have coffee. So I have these. Um, I've got some. Oh. I've, got, I've got, can everybody hear me? Hmm. Use that one. Okay. Um, I've got a couple. Also, if you have questions, um, we are happy to answer them. Please find yourself at that microphone kind of mid-room. Um, we would really appreciate it. Everyone will be able to hear it as well as uh, we'll be able to record it. So my seahorse bucks, I have, well, first of all, I really enjoy editing grants. Um, I also have a bicycle powered pop-up picnic that feeds 48 people. And I have a Peter Putter, Peter Pugger pug mill. Peter Pugger pug mill. You you Introduce yourself. So, hi, my name's Claire. Um, <laughs> oh, be really cool to yeah. Oh, no. Go ahead. I think it's just getting started. Go ahead. It's switching colors. Um, I have a crash pad in Hawaii. Oh, I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a set of soda fired coffee cups, and I have uh, skills baking. 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 Skills. Baking. Tina, what do you have? I also have not only a place to stay in Hawaii, <laughs> I have a studio that somebody could use in Hawaii, a clay studio and a painting studio. I have mad drawing skills, and I have a kiln that could be used Whoa. in Hawaii. Okay. So what's going to happen? We are going to open trading. Um, I, I want. I want to fire some work because remember I took that beginning class mm -hmm. and I came out of it with like four unfired pieces and now I don't have access to a kiln anymore. So I need that. Does anybody want my business consulting for a kiln firing? I'll take it. Oh, okay. yes. Thank you. <laughs> totally. So with my picnic, I actually really need um, some baking. Um, <laughs> I have... Grant editing and a Peter Bugger. Oh, I need grant editing. Grant editing for baking. <laughs> Does anybody want some weird sounds for a trip to Hawaii? <laughs> no, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Oh, I, I guess we can say sometimes this happens, you know. It's like not, not every deal is a great deal, but. But I will, I really want, I'll give, I'll give up my, I'll give up my underscoring and my podcast for a place to crash in Hawaii if I ever make it there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But actually, I really want that underscoring 
<laughs> so, what do you want? What do you got? What do you got? She I got a Peter Pugger. Yes, please. <laughs> nice. So what I just demonstrated was a three-way trade. Ooh. It's possible. Oh. <laughs> so who has questions? Yeah. Thanks, guys. So that's how it works. And we have about, how much time do we have left? We have about 15 minutes left. Um, and we actually would really encourage trading. Um, and also questions for us. Um, and we can kind of do them concurrently as well. Um, if people have uh, a question about the exercise or even just in general about um, the workbook uh, or our toolkits or business plans, anything yeah. is welcome. Otherwise, we're just going to turn you loose. Yeah. Yes, sir. And there's a microphone behind you if you want to speak up. OK. It's a good question. So the question, I'll just repeat it. Um, do we put one thing on the buck or do we list them? There's a couple of different things that I would recommend, actually. One is to put one thing on each buck. Um, and if you need more bucks, there's actually might be a few more floating around. Um, the other thing is to kind of think in your mind about what it is that you're looking for, because that's how the bartering becomes more successful. If you know that you are in need of baking, then you might actually be uh, looking for that. And so you may actually put something to that in, you might indicate that in your buck as well. Um, so I would say one on each buck, because then it becomes a currency. And on your buck, I would also recommend putting your name and your contact information. Um, because you can't, re you can't actually get that, your, you can't make that exchange without that information. Any other questions? Questions? Yes, go ahead and uh, if you wouldn't mind, so we can record your question, that would be great. So, is this on? Yes. Oh, it is, okay. Um, so if you have this pug mill, it's somewhere mm -hmm. far, far away from here probably. Mm -hmm. So are you sending me the pug mail, or are you, or we do have to bring the pug mail to you? You pay shipping. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha. We have to bring our clay to your pug mail to get pugged? Yeah, that would be great. Far, far away? I live in Minnesota. Okay. How far away is that from so, you? So what I'm saying is that you'd have to say what you can give and where. Exactly. So. It's true. Yes. Yeah. And so if there's any contingencies that you want to put on your seahorse box, that's really key. Um, and I would highly recommend not putting something that you don't actually really want to give away because people will snatch it up and then you'll be obligated. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm uh, Valerie Zimini from Clemson University, and I'm actually here with my CSR team for Inseca from Clemson. They're two students out of the six I'm back here. Nice work, We're guys. on your map, too. Thank you for including us. So we've had, this is our fifth season, and we've been running it as a university undergraduate research initiative to promote student artists for our university. Mm -hmm. So we have a really invested and interested audience already in the CSR program. But after five semesters, I think we're starting to reach like a market saturation in terms of like, how do you keep the CSR going for a long time? And some of the regional CSRs that have been in the, um, I guess Asheville or other kind of southern regions have run into maybe a similar thing because we see some of them have become inactive. So is there a recommendation you have for longevity for this type of program? Um, I would say, well, let me say this. We've also run into the same thing. And as we, when we made the program, um, we've seen the same sort of attrition rate or saturation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's two programs in one city. Uh, we didn't build it as something that lives forever, mm -hmm. uh, just in the same way that when you build a business, uh, that business should have a planned life cycle. Uh, if you say it's just going to go on forever, that's not proper business planning. Um, I think for the people who, including Springboard with ours, what we had done was scale it back. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to use fewer artists. Um, in, in shorter cycles, which is to say, to make sure that your CSR program is scaled to market demand, because um, it's still a transactional relationship. Um, the other thing is that we've challenged people to do is to break out of visual arts. Uh, mm -hmm. Visual arts work best for that particular toolkit, um, and performing arts don't work as well 
but we feel that because it's a harder nut to crack, there is a new market there that when you find the right niche, a performative niche of some sort, um, because the hurdle is high to innovate in that way, it means that there is not market saturation there. Mm -hmm. So that's usually the challenge we say is to basically get weird and crazy um, <laughs> out of your comfort zone um, and really strive to innovate um, in a way that feels not very safe. Right. And it's not safe, it's risky, but that's one of the things that artists are best at. We're very good at innovating and taking crazy risks, um, falling on our face and getting it back up and <laughs> doing it again. So. Well, we've run it for seven semesters, and your toolkit was absolutely great. So thank you very much. <laughs> Hooray. One other, one other thought that I have that's probably generalizing it a little bit also for those of you who are not uh, CSA, marketing a CSA, and that is to think about extra or additional partner organizations um, or additional markets that are outside of your current market that may actually help, um, again, broaden, broaden your market reach. Um, so there might be like another group or school that you could partner with in order to bring in other interested partners that might also help. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. I Hi. just want to know where the woman is who has the house in Hawaii. Oh, where, where did she go? She's over there. Tina, raise your hand. False advertising, where is she? If you want a running head start, we'll let you out the door first. <laughs> um, I will say, just because we do have some of the hard copies here that we brought as samples, um, if we, how many do we have, four? Yep. Uh, if you have a seahorse buck and you want to put something on it that would springboard, I, what, you know, we're springboard, like, we're yep. in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah, but, but we're here for a week. Sure, a repeating vector pattern. Would work. That's a trade. If you bring that buck up, I will give you a hard copy of this, but we only have a handful of them. So, like, this kind of thing works, too. Oh. Whoa, I'll take it. Oh. Um, yeah. Yeah, when I first, the go. first time I did this game, what I did yes. was I gave everybody three seahorse bucks, and then I gave everyone three real dollars. So that you could have either this fake money or just like three bucks, and it was very interesting to see. So you can trade them for actual wow. objects. You should check out our Hold toolkit. On. I don't. Wait, wait, what's happening over here? <laughs> We're trading. Did my? Wait. Okay. No. Um, I can. I don't know if I have a books left yeah. for everything. <laughs> How many books do we have left? There we go. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I have. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, but if you don't we get a print have... one and you go to this creative exchange, you can download the you PDF can download for, free. for free. Yeah, so you can get the, yeah. the hard copy. Yeah. So, because I think we just ran out of books. Hold on, let me check. Yeah. Um, so... No, for me. Oh. Awesome. I want cool. console. No, anybody who can think that they have something to help me with. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know what to do. Now I'm in a... Can I give you my business card? That would be... I can do that in my sleep. <laughs> I don't know. You should trade this one Hello. to Anna. She does arts education. Yeah. I have an offer and a need. have a graphic designer? <laughs> my uh, offer is a sale on San Francisco I'm Bay. My need is for consultation about product did I, did I push everyone specifications. Away? So I'm stuck with my book because I said no. So if you go to that yeah. website, yeah. but you can also getting get clear about uh, yeah, getting clear about the product. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to give you this in case you can. That's another art one because I'm a composer. Yeah. How about the arts? Yeah, of course. Well, I'd have to come to you at some point. It's just a nice show. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so it's actually Council Bluff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.